Thanks for joining us on another journey. Today, we're in Maine, and we're with Willow with Flora Funga Farms. That's fun to say. Yeah, yeah, that's like a tongue like twister. <laughs> you say that a couple times too many times fast. That's alliteration at its <laughs> finest. She's an expert on mushrooms. Not, Not the psychedelic, psychedelic ones. ones. <laughs> but she knows about that too. Yeah. <laughs> Will, what's the name of your company? Oh yeah, it's called Flora Funga Farms, and we're based out of Mount Desert, Maine. We're going mushroom foraging today. Going to learn about some different types of mushrooms. Mushroom tourism. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys are interested in a tour, Will does uh, private tours to learn about mushrooms and all the different uh, species of trees and plants in the uh, Maine area. If you're new to the channel, this is April, and I'm Wayne. Hit that subscribe button and smash that bell. We do a video every Thursday. So sit back, relax, and, and enjoy, enjoy the, the journey. journey. Well, let's go get some mushrooms. Definitely, yeah. let's go. Hi, I'm Willow uh, from Flora Funga Farms in Mount Desert, Maine. And uh, we grow and forage wild mushrooms and plants for edible and medicinal purposes. Uh, this year we've mostly just been doing uh, guided foraging tours in the woods around Mount Desert Island. I think it's a Calibia or a Gymnopus, but it's not like a, it's not a very common mushroom. Okay. So it's not one that I'm uh, familiar with off the top of my head. Um, but it's a gilled mushroom, so like if you were going to try to figure out what it was, you could say, okay, so the cap is relatively smooth, um, it seems to absorb water, um, and it's got gills underneath. Yeah. So there are mushrooms that have like spines or like a spongy tube layer, um, so what's underneath the cap is, very, is like the first thing you should look at, basically. Oh, okay. Um, well, maybe the second thing. So the first thing would be like, where is it growing? Right. What kind of trees is it growing near? Um, and then, you know, how is it growing? Is it is there just one? Are they like a little cluster like this? Mm -hmm. um, and then like, what does it smell like? That sort of thing. This one has kind of a sweet smell. It's mushroomy, but it also, it's almost like, like a hint of anise or something. It's like a little bit of a sweet smell. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Now, is that edible? Um, those are, I think they're considered edible, but they tend to accumulate heavy metals from the soil. They're not oh, so that, they're not something that you really should eat. They're definitely like a, a forest floor decomposer. So they're actually decomposing all these twigs and oh. needles and cones and all that other stuff. Did you know that? Um, I didn't know that. So, That's fascinating. I know nothing about mushrooms. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> Except that they taste good. Yeah, there's like, like categories or like groupings of mushrooms based on their habit. Uh -huh. So there's sapotrophic mushrooms which break down wood or leaf litter or grass or any, some kind of other material um, that can be decomposed. And then there's mycorrhizal mushrooms which are mushrooms that are symbiotic with trees. So they actually form all these connections with the roots of trees under the soil and like are able to receive nutrients from the tree like glucose because the tree can make pretty much unlimited glucose from right. sunlight and co2 in the air right and in exchange the fungi are able to penetrate like 10 times the surface area that the tree would within the soil so they're huh. they're like making up the soil basically and so they're able to extract nutrients like phosphorus and other micronutrients that the tree needs and actually give those to the tree in exchange oh. for that glucose and not only that but they're also connecting like one tree to another through like a network in the soil of the forest floor so fungi are not just essential for like making sure that carbon that gets trapped by trees goes back into the atmosphere um, but also they're important for the health and like wellness and longevity of any forest ecosystem. So this one here uh, is Fomatopsis monsiae. Uh, it's called the red belted polypore and it's a type of 
Polypores are a type of mushroom that rather than gills, they actually have a layer of tubes that makes up, you can see the tubes there. Hmm. They have this layer of tubes where the spores come out um, and it presents itself on the spore bearing surface as like um, a, a bunch of pores. Anyway, so this is a um, medicinal mushroom. Um, it has chemicals in it that help to balance the activity of the human immune system, as well as um, some anti-inflammatory compounds that are really beneficial for gastrointestinal inflammation. So, mm, so I these, should be eating this. Yeah, yeah. these can, can be really <laughs> beneficial to anyone with like acid reflux or an ulcer or any kind of, even like in, inflammatory bowel disease, any kind of like food sensitivity issues, these can be really helpful um, as an addition. And the way they're prepared is uh, you slice them up into strips mm -hmm. and dry them out. And then you take the dried slices and you just simmer them in a pot of water or a crock pot um, overnight or for, you know, several hours. And then you just drink the resulting liquid. Um, and it has kind of a, a sour taste, sort of like lemony flavor. Um, most mushroom most medicinal mushrooms tend to be extremely bitter, but this one is kind of an exception. It's more oh. sour than bitter. Interesting. Yeah. And and how long would you have to eat that to get rid of like an ulcer or something? Um, it's just, it just like aids in healing. So it doesn't necessarily like, if you have an ulcer, it's probably the result of um, some kind of pattern oh, in the way that you, you eat or, or like some genetic thing or something or yes. a medication you take or did sure. take something like that. So like this would be a great adjunct to like also changes in, you know, lifestyle and right. stuff like that. So are so, all these the same so, then? Yep, Th these so mushrooms here are the same? These are from a previous year. So they're already like decomposing. Oh, um, so they're uh, they're dead. Yeah, well the and the fungus may still be alive within this log. Uh -huh. um, but these fruits are from a previous year. And normally these fruits are perennial. Um, they're what's called the perennial conch, which is a type of mushroom that has the ability to grow multiple years from the same fruiting body. So over here there's a first year conch. And so they're actually you can see they're softer and more pliable and these actually make the best medicine because they're just they have the least amount of bugs and dirt and other stuff trapped in them but you can see there you can rip them right apart there yeah there's nothing really going on with them whereas this one you can see has multiple layers of tubes and that's because it's multiple years old mm -hmm. so you can see one year worth of tubes and then another and then this year's right on top so this is at least three years old so if you pull that off is that killing the mushroom it's kind of like picking an apple so you're okay. just removing the fruiting body the reproductive structure from the body of the fungus which is actually within the substrate so picking a mushroom is not harmful to the fungus any more so than like walking over where the fungus is growing is harmful to the fungus. Um, so whether you cut it or rip it or pluck it or twist it, it doesn't matter as long as you're not, you know, removing the actual body of the fungus. So like if you take the whole log with you, then you're having an impact, I would say. Right. <laughs> hmm. um, but the fungus, if it wants to reproduce again and has the capacity to, it will. And if you don't take all of the fruit bodies, then it's still going to be able to produce lots of spores. And this one is even producing spores in my hand right now. So as I'm carrying this around, it'll continue to release spores and maybe even get them further than it would have sitting on the log. So, oh, so some it people could think, actually help it. Yeah, some people think picking mushrooms is actually something you, that is helpful to the mushrooms in the same way that like a squirrel burying an acorn helps the oak tree survive to future generations. Do modern medicines use fungi? Yeah, in um in China, for example, there's a drug that's extracted from turkey tail mushroom that's used as an adjunct to chemotherapy and other treatments that suppress the immune system. So um, basically it just helps to keep the white blood cell count high enough so that a cancer patient doesn't die of like an infection that would not kill a normal person, right, basically. Right. So I can't remember the name of the drug, but Tremedes versicolor turkey tail is the mushroom that they extract it from and you can get the same benefits from that mushroom just by boiling it into a decoction and drinking it. You wow. don't necessarily need high-tech equipment to extract it 
and make a pill out of it, you know. <laughs> oh, here's, okay, so here is, remember I was talking about those cords? Oh, like, yeah. That, Hang on one second. That the, uh... Oh, you're wrong. Okay, yeah. so these are rhizomorphs. They're, um, they're like concentrated cords of mycelium that are produced by the honey fungus. And this is what allows the honey fungus or armillaria mushrooms to take over large areas of forest in their sort of parasitic life cycle. They use these tubes to send water across long distances um, and that allows them to kind of colonize and conquer entire forests. So that's um, what you were talking about with the mushrooms in Colorado. Yeah, yes, exactly. So this, when you see this kind of like thready black stuff on a, on a tree, that's a really good indicator that honey mushrooms can be found nearby especially when the conditions are right for their fruit in so cool wet weather like we're having right now right so hopefully we'll see some honey mushrooms around once we get a little further in Crepidotus. Um, so these are just like a these are like a little oyster shaped kind of mushroom. There's a lot. There's a mushroom called the oyster mushroom that looks pretty similar. The differences are though that these drop brown spores and they are not edible. Whereas oyster mushrooms are larger and they drop white or a lilac spore print and uh, those are edible. Um, but so this would be a good one for people to know if they're out foraging for oyster mushrooms because it is a um, not necessarily toxic but it's a non-edible look-alike of oyster mushrooms. Okay, so one of those ones you can get confused on. Exactly, yeah. So this is uh, Sarcomyxa serotina. Uh, it's also called the late fall oyster or the olive oysterling. Um, and these are kind of similar in appearance to oysters, but they have yellow gills that make up a very small portion of the cap. You can see there's a lot more flesh in there than, than gill. Mm -hmm. Whereas on a regular oyster mushroom, it's more gill than flesh. Um, so these are very, very young ones, but these are edible and medicinal mushroom as well. They're very good for the immune system and they also are just delicious. Uh, they do require a little bit extra cooking compared to most mushrooms just because they're uh, a little bitter when they're undercooked so just make sure you get them nice and crispy um, but they do have a few look-alikes the way you can identify them um, separate them from say a crepidotis or something else that looks like them these typically have a green or a purplish hue to the cap and they'll get more purple uh, as the temperature gets really cold and these guys can actually grow as large depending on the the conditions if we have a, a mild early winter these could grow to be up to you know eight to twelve inches across oh wow so they can become very large mushrooms um, and they typically grow off of dead logs and standing dead trees as like um, a series of like shelves or shells coming out of the, hmm. the side of the tree um, these are a great edible mushroom but they're they're a little bit small so um, we'll probably just take a couple and and leave the rest to get bigger yeah Okay, what do we find? So this is violet juice polypore. Um, it's a decomposer of the softwood or the, the outer wood of trees. And uh, it has pores that resemble teeth or spines. Um, and I'll see, I'll get a close up of that as well. Um, but the, uh, these guys are not necessarily, they're too rubbery to be eaten, and they're, um, but I believe they can be used to dye a fabric, um, and they have uh, an important role to play in the ecosystem as well. They're one of the mushrooms that's commonly misidentified uh, as turkey tail. Uh, so turkey tail mushroom actually looks fairly similar to this, but it tends to grow in more of a rosette pattern, and the underside is pure white um, and very, very, very small pores as opposed to these tooth-like structures. Um, and you can see why it's called the violet tooth or the violet sided polypore because it has this violet edge. Right. Um, and that color can be less or more intense depending on, on the individual specimen. Um, one interesting thing about this fungus is it has an affinity to grow a certain algae on top of it, which is why some of these are green. 
Um, so it's kind of uh, behaving a little bit like a lichen in that way, hmm. where it's it's got algae growing alongside it. But unlike a lichen, it's not actually benefiting from the algae in any way. I think the algae just likes to hang out here. Oh. So this tree's pretty much dead because of this then? I think it died probably of something else, like the top broke off or something. Uh -huh. And then th these guys are just digesting the bark. So we have some entirely strange looking honey mushrooms here. Normally the cap is larger than the stalk, but because of the very bizarre conditions we're in right now, uh, um, these mushrooms have grown with much larger stalks than caps. Um, but honey mushrooms in general are easy to identify um, because of their very thick stalks, which can be anywhere from a centimeter to three or four centimeters thick, and their caps which have little tiny uh, tufts of hairs on the cap which are most dense in the center so you can see those little hairs on the cap and these guys drop a white spore print so you'll often find them in a big cluster and where the caps overlap each other you'll be able to see a white spore deposit on the, the tops of the mushrooms mm. and these are edible when they're thoroughly cooked um, undercooked honey mushrooms can cause pretty severe gastrointestinal upset so you really want to ideally like parboil these and then fry them or bake them or something like that or stew them for a long time you really want to make sure these are cooked so that you don't get sick um, they do have a few toxic look-alikes one of them is the deadly gallerina gallerina marginata um, but that mushroom has a very thin stalk it's much more fragile uh, not nearly as fibrous as this mushroom and uh, it tends to grow more singular and scattered as opposed to in a cluster. So just make sure whenever you're harvesting honey mushrooms that you check your cluster and make sure it doesn't have any little tiny uh, other little small brown mushrooms attached to it because they could kill you. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So we're looking for honey mushrooms, uh, which are in the genus Armillaria, and they're a parasitic mushroom uh, that attacks trees of various sorts. Uh, the ones we're going to be looking at are on spruce trees, um, and they grow in like a dense cluster, typically either off the side of a tree or the base or out of the roots of the tree. And they're actually not only digesting the heartwood of that tree, but they're also sapping nutrients from the tree that it would be using to, you know, continue its life. Oh, so it's um, actually harmful to the tree. Oh yeah, so it's kind of like a forester's nightmare. Um, they're, they're actually like, in um, Colorado, I believe, there's the largest, what's considered the largest living organism on the planet, um, which is actually a honey mushroom as well, hmm. uh, that stretches over some like, insane number of acres um, in this aspen forest. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So these leaves. are the leaves of uh, sugar maple, which is Acer saccharinum, uh, and that's this tree right here. This is a relatively young one. It's probably about 30 years old or so. And um, these leaves are green throughout the year due to the chlorophyll in them that helps them photosynthesize. Um, but they also, that whole time, have uh, two other pigments inside them a yellow one called xanthochromes and a, uh, a red one called anthocyanins. And those actually provide protection from radiation from the sun. Um, and so they're actually present in the leaf the whole time, um, but they're obscured by the green chlorophyll until fall when the tree reclaims that chlorophyll for nutrients um, that it stores in its roots over the winter, at which point the pigments are revealed. Um, and how they get revealed um, and how intense the colors are depends on the temperature um, that it is during the fall. So like if we have especially cool nights, um, we get especially vibrant foliage. Okay. How did you learn all this stuff, Will? Oh, I studied botany at the College of the Atlantic um, and I had a really amazing botany professor, um, Dr. Raja Karuna, and he uh, taught me just like so much about not just about botany, but also about like how to go about exploring and learning about the natural world, um, sort of on my own. That's so awesome. Was, yeah, he was very inspiring, and we just like our classes consisted of like, okay, like here's a list of like 50 plants that grow around here. Like, go out, find them, like get specimens and like learn them, and there'll be a quiz next week. You know, <laughs> like yeah, yeah, yeah. so That's it was cool. like really intense, and then we would go on these walks and 
like he would teach us all about the different plants, their medicinal uses, their historical uses, um, and their role in the ecosystem and all of that. So it's it's become kind of like a more than just like something I've studied, it's become like a way of life for me. Yeah. yeah. Well, we can tell it's your life now. It's, yeah. <laughs> this is your business, this is what you do from day to day now. Yeah. So yeah. If you guys want a tour, check out the link below. You see that like kind of charcoal looking thing? This thing? Yeah. So that's a piece of chaga there. It's um, it's not actually a mushroom, but it's a storage organ for a fungus. Kind of like a potato is a storage organ for the potato plant. So the chaga fungus is parasitic on birch trees and it slowly digests and, and kills the birch tree. And then when the birch tree is, is dead, it actually produces its fruit body, which is really inconspicuous mushroom. You wouldn't even know it was a mushroom. It's like a, looks like parchment or something. Huh. But the, um, that sclerotia, that thing that we know is the chaga mushroom is actually like where it stores all of the nutrients that it's stealing from the birch tree. And so then when the birch tree is dormant or after the birch tree is dead, it's able to draw those nutrients out of its storage organ. But that's the part that people harvest for medicine. Oh, okay. um, it's great for lowering blood pressure. It's also extremely high in antioxidants. I think somebody said it was like the most, the highest source of antioxidants like of any known food. Oh, but oh I mean, wow. It doesn't necessarily mean that those are all bioavailable to you. This is the yellow birch? Yellow birch, uh, Betula alleghaniensis. And uh, one of the interesting things, it's pretty easy to identify these just based on the bark. It's peely like a white birch, but it peels and tears in much smaller fragments. So you're not likely to get like, you couldn't really make a canoe out of this birch bark. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's very easily torn. Um, and More like all paper. parts of the, the bark, when you scratch it, it actually has a, uh, a scent of wintergreen or root beer to it. And it has that same flavor as well. So if you want to smell that, you can chew on it too. You can use like a birch, you can use birch twigs to, uh, to clean your teeth as well. So you can kind of like use them as a natural toothpick. Um, but that, what you're tasting is betulinic acid and salicylic acid, which are both anti-inflammatory. What's, what's this? Is this something different? This is that violet-sided polypore yeah. again. It's the same one. It looks different, though. Yeah, they do vary a little bit in, in, in terms of color. Yeah, you can definitely see the violet on these. Oh, yeah. What do we got here? These are hyphaloma. Uh, they're called brick cap, um, and they are considered edible, um, although they're not necessarily... Ooh, those are pretty. Yeah, these are, these are kind of... They're definitely a lovely mushroom. Oops, and now they're destroyed. But there was a, uh, there are a few different species of hyphaloma. Some of them are edible and some of them are toxic. There's one called the sulfur tuft that's bright yellow uh, that's considered toxic. Um, and hyphalomas typically have a, like a dark, kind of a gray purple spore print. Um, so the spores they drop out of there will leave a deposit on neighboring mushrooms or on a piece of paper if you the cap off and, and leave it upside down on a piece of paper. But they're hyphalomas. They grow on uh, typically conifer wood. They de they're a decomposer. Okay. Um, but yeah, since I'm not 100% sure on what species these are. We're going to leave them. We're going to leave them for the squirrels. We're, we're not eating those. Yeah. <laughs> Those are crepidotus. These are actually a guild mushroom. So these are, it's possible to confuse these if you're a beginner. These could be confused for oyster mushrooms, but these are brown and they, they're very small and they have a brown spore print as well. So these are definitely not edible. Um, they're also quite rubbery. Um, so I don't think they would be particularly tasty. Is it, so this another is a mushroom? Species, yeah, it's another species of Fomatopsis. These ones are actually, um, they're old, they're, they're no longer alive. Um, but these were traditionally used by the native people of this area, the Wabanaki people, to, um, to transport fire. So you would pound, what they would do is pound these into a pulp and then put that pulp in between two uh, scallop shells or something and then place a uh, burning ember in the middle of all that fluff 
and wrap it up between the shells and that way they could carry the ember in their, you know, in their sack, their backpack for, you know, the whole day and it will keep smoldering in there and then when they get to their new camp they just like start their fire with that ember. And I mean this is obviously like, you're, we're talking about thousands of, you know, I mean anywhere from, you know, 400 years ago back to like 10,000 years ago people have been using this technique. This is obviously before matches and lighters <laughs> wow. had occurred to anyone. Um, but also this is one of the fungi that was found with the Iceman that was found in, in Northern Europe. Um, and he had a bunch of different fungi on like a necklace that he had like threaded and they believe their theory is that he was using it as a, as a bandage like for, for a wound he had sustained hunting or something because he had he had some kind of wound on him that had this mushroom like all packed into it so um, huh. maybe that's part of the reason why he, he froze to death in the ice or whatever he maybe he was sick or something but Right. Um, it's evidence that, you know, people 15,000 years ago were using this fungus for medicinal purposes and also to transport fire. Hmm. So these are all hemlocks. You can see the really deep shade you get. Yeah. Hemlock yeah, that's almost dark. So this is a gomphidius. It's uh, a late season mushroom that has what we call decurrent gills. And that just means the gills run down the stalk, as you can see there. And that's one of the defining characteristics of this mushroom. It also drops a very dark, almost black spore print. You can see some of those spores standing there on the stalk. Um, and the, some of these are edible, but they're they're just gross looking and not really. I like them, I think they're cool no, looking. I mean, some people might want to eat them. They're, they're typically in wetter weather, they tend to be really slimy and kind of un unappetizing in appearance, but that one looks all right, actually. Hmm. April found something? Yeah. What'd you find? I don't know. Looks like a... puffball, maybe? Or an earth ball. I think this is an earth ball, which it belongs to the genus Scleroderma. Uh, so they're, they resemble the edible puffballs, um, but they tend to be less than edible. You know, this might be a truffle, actually. It's very squishy, whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you can actually... I'm not actually sure what that is. Huh. That's mm. befuddling me. I'll put that one in here, too. See if we can ID it. This is Comptonia peregrina, sweet fern. It has a really lovely scent. And you can burn it as incense. You can also make a tea with it. Um, you just don't want to consume too much of it because it can stress out your kidneys a little bit. Um, so when you make a tea, you want to use like, it's kind of like green tea. You want to use hot but not boiling water because you don't want to extract too much of the, the medicinal stuff from it. But it does have like a, a pretty um, like piney, almost like citrusy, spicy kind of a smell. This right here is part of a pitch pine. Um, you can see the, the needles are flat and they're, uh, they come in a cluster of three, as opposed to five, like you would see in an eastern white pine. Huh. Uh, and we just have a couple pines with three needles around here. Um, the number of needles per bundle is uh, the primary way that you tell pines apart. That and the shape of the cone. Oh, okay. This is a Stropharia rugoso annulata. Uh, it's called the wine cap mushroom. And they're called that because when they're young, the cap tends to be like a, a wine red color. This one has been bleached by the sun a little bit. And they have a purple spore print. You can see the, the spores staining the stalk there, all purple. Um, and these are actually a common garden mushroom. And I grew this one in my yard. Um, and they actually can lend a helping hand to the soil in your garden to help break down uh, wood chips and other organic matter into soil and nutrients that the plants can use um, and they're delicious edible so they're all around a nice mushroom to have around your yard um, and all you need to do to start your own patch is just uh, order some wine cap mycelium and mix it up with some hardwood wood chips hmm. and throw it in the garden that's pretty much it cool we want to thank you guys for watching our video all the way to the end if you would hit that subscribe button share it with a friend and like always thank you for, for living, living life